Put your hands together. Go ahead and greet someone and you may be seated. Welcome to the Crossroads. If you're tuning in for the first time, as I look around, everybody's here. If you're tuning in for the first time, we just want to say welcome home. We thank God for you and for the opportunity that we have to share the Word of God with everyone here today. Amen? Amen. God is amazing. He's been doing some great things. And I just, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank you all for yesterday. Yesterday was an amazing day. We had our replenish day. We came out. We were good stewards of the church. But boy, did you all show up as good. You know, we have a good, good father, but you all came out. And I thank God for all of you for all that was done. I mean, if you touch a light switch around here, just know it's been disaffected. Every light switch, every doorknob, a first floor, second floor has been taken care of. Windows, doors, floors, outside, inside. I just thank God for all of you and everything that's done. Come on, put your hands together. If you weren't able to come, we understand, but guess what? You get another opportunity in the fall to be a part of it, because we want to try to do this twice a year. Like I said, we had a lot accomplished. We had over 40 people here yesterday. Um, we had at least 16 teenagers that came out. Gary in the garden, he's just thrilled. The parking lot got scraped up. Kids were out there weeding. and oh, Just an amazing time. And I just thank God. And we were trying to fit it in, you know, just before March Madness really got going. Even though Duke's not there anymore, I won't talk about it. But, and before, easy killer, easy, slow down. Uh, and also, you know, NBA and all this other stuff, but we were able to put it in, and like I said, we're going to try to do it again in the fall and just keep working on certain projects, whatever's needed in the church, because this is the house of God, and we want to take care of it. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right, so let's get into the Word. Last week, I shared with you all about moving forward, right? And I, I'll tell you that after I shared that Word, God impressed something on my heart. I mean, right after... As I was leaving, he put something on my heart, which leads us to today's message. And he began to show me another reason why people aren't moving forward. He started telling me, he's like, people aren't moving forward in me because they're living paralyzed lives. Paralyzed lives. Now, when you think about paralyzed lives, we're not talking about your legs are paralyzed or some other part of your body's paralyzed. We're talking about paralyzed life, totality. In other words, your senses are paralyzed. So your eyes are paralyzed. You have no vision. You can't see. You can't hear. You can't speak because you're paralyzed. You're not unable to speak. Then your emotions are paralyzed. Your thoughts are paralyzed. So you're completely paralyzed and you're not able to move in any direction. And God was showing me, he's saying, people in the church not just outside the church, in the church, are living paralyzed lives. And then he gave me the reason why. I was like, okay, Lord, help me out here. Why is it that they're living paralyzed lives? And he shared that it stems from an emotion. He says the main cause for people living paralyzed lives is due to an emotion known as fear. Fear. And Dan starts out with fear this morning. I didn't even look that up. <laughs> Fear. Fear is a, a feeling that we get. It's an unpleasant feeling caused by belief. Not unbelief, belief in someone or something that is threatening to harm you or someone or something that can cause you pain or even death. That's what fear is. It's that type of emotion. So basically what happens is that this emotion grabs a hold of us, and it keeps us from moving forward, and it causes us to become fearful. Because of the belief we have that this thing is threatening, that this thing can cause these bad things to us, it causes us to become fearful. And you all have been fearful before, have you not? There are people that are fearful of so many things. There are people that are fearful of sickness. They're fearful of disease. They're fearful of death. I mean, we're not too far removed from COVID, and you want to talk about how fear was stirred up during that. There was fear about sickness, disease, don't touch me, six feet, stay away, this, that. That fear rose up, and it kept people isolated. It kept people from moving. It kept people separated from one another, and we're still dealing with those effects now where people don't want to congregate. They don't want to get together, and it's still that fear. And then you have being fearful of certain situations, you're fearful of 
death, as I mentioned. You're fearful of, not, of losing your job, let's say, of losing your job, not being able to pay bills, not being able to pay for your home. You're fearful of being embarrassed. You're fearful of, being, of having your reputation destroyed. You're fearful of defeat or failure. You know, Sean, throw you, not on, under the bus, but throw you over the bus. Sean started a business. He could have been fearful that, hey, can I get this business going? Do I have the funds? Do I have the capital? Do I have this? But no, he ran off with it. And I thank God for you, brother. I thank God for the entrepreneurs that we have within the house of God. Amen? But we become fearful of so much. Yeah, something to clap about. We become fearful of so much. We become fearful of being replaced. We become fearful of being rejected by those we're trying to be accepted by. Come on, Facebook people. <laughs> Come on now. We become fearful of, ready, of losing a son or a daughter. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about fearful of losing a son or a daughter who's embarked in a new job or a new relationship, and we become fearful of that relationship that you had as a parent or whatever being distanced or being pulled away. So we become fearful of those things. We even become fearful of never finding love, never being involved in love or being able to give love or receive love, fearful of not finding a partner, fearful of not finding a companion, fearful of not ever finding a spouse or getting married or fearful of not having kids and in some people's cases fearful of having kids again <laughs> but we become fearful 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 and what happens is that that emotion has a paralyzing effect on us and it's had a paralyzing effect on so many people that it's caused them the inability to be able to move forward because they're just so fearful you're fearful so you're like I'm not gonna do anything because I'll be embarrassed. I'm not going to get up here and speak because I'm going to feel humiliated. I'm not going to step out here and start this business because I may fail. I'm not going to go out here and ask this person out because they might reject me. Fearful, fearful, fearful. And if you're ever going to do or become what God has called you to do, what he's assigned you to do, you have to learn how to overcome paralyzing fear. Amen. You've got to learn how to overcome paralyzing fear. Realize that any time fear enters the domain of your life, it's not from God. It's not from God. Any time fear enters the domain of your conversation, of your emotions, of your thoughts, of your decision-making process, it's not from God. So I don't want to buy this house because I'm afraid. Or I don't want to sell this house because I'm afraid. Or I don't want to do this. Or I don't want to do... It's not of God. 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of what? Of love, power, and a sound mind. He's given us love, power, and a sound mind. Not fear. Not fear. He didn't give us fear. But what happens is if we live in the domain of fear, if we live in that, we shut ourselves off from access to those other three things. We're basically saying, I'm going to live under this covering versus that covering. So instead of having love, you actually deal with hatred. Instead of love, you deal with hatred. Instead of power, you deal with weakness. Instead of a sound mind, you deal with ignorance. Come on. Come on, somebody. Stay with me. You deal with ignorance, and fear is going to cause you to make illogical, unscriptural uh, decisions regarding certain things because you're making these choices based on fear and nothing else. Based on fear. You're, you're making decisions like, well, I won't do this because of fear. I won't do that. And people are looking at you like, what is wrong with you? W what's wrong? Because you're operating in fear. And when you operate in fear, you're operating in a realm that God never intended for you to be in. It's a realm that God never intended for you to be in. So it's time for us to move forward out of fear. We've got to get out of the covering of fear and get under the covering of God. Amen? Amen. Fear is not going to cover us. Fear is not going to provide for us. But I'll tell you about somebody who will, and that's God. God's going to provide for us. He's going to cover us. He's going to provide for us. So today we're going to look at 2 Chronicles 20, and we're going to talk about King Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat, he was encamped by fear, but he also provides us ways to navigate through it. So starting with verse 1, you ready? Here we go. 
It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared. I want to stop right there for a second. There's a comma. And Jehoshaphat feared. Jehoshaphat feared. He became afraid. It says it. Scripture says he was afraid. So I'm here to tell you that we're all going to be afraid at some point or another. And he was afraid. And why was he afraid? Because some had come to him and told him about these things. He was afraid about what they had said. So I have to share with you again, like I shared before, be careful who you allow to speak into your life. Because some will share certain things, and what they end up doing is planting thoughts in your head. They'll plant thoughts in your head, and it'll cause us to live our lives like Jehoshaphat did for that moment where we fear and we're unable to move. We become immobilized and paralyzed based on what they said. For example, someone has an appointment set up for them by a doctor. The doctor says, hey, I want to see you make an appointment with uh, one of the nurses or one of the assistants and come and see me. And right away, you're like, okay. And you share it with a friend. You tell your friend, you know, the doctor wanted to see me, but they didn't explain why they wanted to see me. They just said set up an appointment. And the friend, in all innocence, says, wow, I know you had that issue. Hopefully it's not cancer. I'll be praying for you. What did they just do at that moment? At that moment, they just planted something inside you that caused you basically to freeze. So now you can no longer, you're paralyzed. You can no longer get past the point that, do I have cancer? Do I have cancer? Is that what the doctor called me about? Is that what the doctor's sharing? So now you've become emotionally paralyzed. You've become mentally paralyzed. You become spiritually paralyzed if you're not seeking God, which we'll talk about here in a second. But you're kind of stuck there because of what they placed in your head. And now you're not able to move. You're not able to do anything. You can't get past the thought of cancer. And yet there's been no doctor report. There's been no proof. There's been nothing. But you're stuck. Not moving forward because you're stuck based upon what somebody planted in your head. And realize that while the enemy tries to keep us paralyzed from moving towards God, he's actually thrusting us in another direction. He's thrusting us towards defeat and death. Because this example that I'm giving you regarding cancer, right away the enemy starts throwing them fiery darts. Well, maybe I do have cancer. And if I do have cancer, wow, I'm going to have to deal with chemo. So now you've got to defeat your attitude becomes defeated. I got to deal with chemo. I got to deal with, with maybe surgery. And then the enemy adds some more. So he just keeps adding and drives you further into defeat and then towards death where you're thinking to yourself, maybe it's spread. Maybe it's gone too far. Maybe I just, I'm not going to live. So now death thoughts kick in. And who's going to take care of my family? Who's going to take care of this? All because someone commented on a doctor's appointment and allowed the enemy to freeze your faith and fire up your fear. Freeze your faith and fire up your fear. But guess what? I'm here today to do the exact opposite. I'm here today to fire up your faith, which is why I'm a little hype, a little excited. I'm trying to keep myself here because I'm about to jump off the stage and I'll scare people and you won't come back, but that's okay. I want to fire up your faith and freeze your fear because I'm here to tell you that you need to rebuke the spirit of fear. And if you don't know what that word rebuke means, that means get it out your life because it doesn't belong there. Because the scripture that I just read to you before said God didn't give it to you. That's a rap song right there. God didn't give it to you. God didn't give it to you. Oh, don't get me started. God didn't give it to you. Look, my wife's like, don't go. Don't go back to the 80s. You know, I had some of the teenagers cracking on me how I was wearing my hat yesterday. They're like, nobody does that anymore. I'm like, I do? You're old. Okay. But (laughs) God hasn't given to us. He hasn't assigned it to us. He didn't provide it to us. It's not ours to grab for this season. Fear is not something seasonal that we grab a hold of. Oh, like spring's here. Fear's here. It's a season of fear. Just got No. 
No, he didn't give it to you. We need to make the declaration. We need to stand strong in believing that what we do have is love. What we do have is power. What we do have is a sound mind, not fear. Amen? We don't have fear fear in our lives. And by having those three things, guess what? If my cup is full of power, if my cup is full of love, if my cup is full of a sound mind, I don't have room for fear. I don't have room for fear. So let's read more of chapter 20 and see that I stopped you at that comma there in verse 3. Jehoshaphat didn't take on the fear. He didn't put it on like this jacket. He doesn't say, I look good in fear, you know? No, he didn't take it on. He actually did three things that we're going to talk about to help him navigate through the fear. Now, like I said before, I want you to realize you will encounter fear. You will. It's inevitable. You will encounter fear, but it's what you do with that encounter that counts. It's what you do with that encounter because we're all going to feel it. The way the wind blows and you feel it, okay, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to run and hide, or are you going to do like Jehoshaphat did? You ready? So he says, you know, it says that he feared, comma, and then he did something else. What did he do? And set himself to seek the Lord. To seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all of Judah. So here we have King Jehoshaphat. Fear? I'm going to seek God about this. What a concept. What a concept. We talked a couple of weeks ago about King Rehoboam, who the people came to him, and he said, all right, you know, give me three days while I, while I consult. At no point did he consult God. He consulted the old, the young. He didn't go to God, and it cost him. Here we have King Jehoshaphat now saying, okay, I, I heard this. It caused me to have fear, but what am I going to do? I'm going to seek God. I'm going to seek God. And how did he seek God? It says the first thing he did, he called a fast. He called for a fast throughout the nation. And a fast, we've talked about this uh, a few months ago, a fast sets you apart. It sets you apart. You, You end up denying those things that would cause you to lose focus. You're basically setting yourself aside to be able to hear from God, to communicate with God. And that's what he does in verse 6. He prays. So not only does he call for a fast, but then he prays. In verse 6, this is his prayer. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? This is him having a level of fear, but then knowing how to navigate through it. This is him saying, I'm afraid, but I'm going to God. I'm going to do a fast. I'm going to set myself aside so I can hear from God, so I could talk to God, and then I'm going to pray and lay it out before him. And the first thing I'm going to do is remind him of who he is so then he can remind me of who I am in him. Amen? So we need to do that. So he's responding to his fear that way. Many of us, we need to respond to our fears that way. When God, when the enemy may come with something, with a thought, with a situation, we need to respond accordingly where we're going to God, not going to man. I'm not going to run to Greg. Greg, I love you, brother, but I'm going to go to God first. I'm going to run to God first. You know, with my wife, the same thing. Love my wife. But if a situation comes up, let me go to God, and then together we're going to pray about it. But I'm not going to seek her, seek my sister-in-law, seek Kathy, seek everybody else, and then, oh, yeah, I guess I should have prayed to God. No, God is first. We, got, we have to seek God first. So that's how he responded. My question to you is how are you responding? Are you responding appropriately? Are you responding to fear with prayer, or are you responding to fear with panic? Because that happens to us. You know, I'll throw both hands up. Sometimes something will happen where we respond in panic instead of responding in, in prayer or praise. We respond in panic where we should be running to God, but our panic keeps us bound. It grips us, and we end up living paralyzed lives again. We're paralyzed, and God is saying not to do that here. That's what we're learning. And then God responds to him in verse 14 and 15. He responds to him. So in verse 14, he speaks through uh, one of the guys, Jehaziel, and in verse 15, this is what he says. He says, listen, all of you, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
And you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. The battle is not yours but God's. We've heard that in songs. We've heard that, you know, with the worship team. But have we really grabbed the hold of it and understand and realize that the battle's not ours, that the battle belongs to the Lord? The battle's not ours. You know what's ours? The prayer. That's our job. The battle is his. The prayer is ours. So we're supposed to pray. That's our part. God's saying, you don't need to do anything in this. I don't want you to fight. I don't want you to send an email. I don't want you to comment. I don't want you to put a bad review. I don't want you to argue. I don't want you to pick up your bat. I don't want you to pull out a gun. I don't want you to do this. I don't want... Just pray. That's your job. The battle belongs to me, God is saying. The battle belongs to him. He's saying there are circumstances that you're going to encounter where your resources aren't going to be enough. Your capabilities aren't enough. Your abilities aren't enough. You know, we all think we're strong, this and that. We can handle it. God's like, it's not enough. Let, leave it to me. I can take care of this. We serve a God who created the universe, and we think we could do better. Come on. The battle belongs to his. God says, don't be driven by that. You need to understand. You need to get it ingrained inside you, deep down in your soul, that what you're facing right now, whatever it is, whatever emotions you're going through, whatever the situation you're in, that God's got it. God's got it. He's the one that's going to step into it. It's not something for you to fight. It's for him to fight because the battle belongs to him. It's not yours. It's not yours. We serve a God that he will step all up in your circumstance like this. And he says, I got this. I'm going to be your defender. You just stay there. You just keep your hands up. Not in defeat, not in surrender to the enemy, in praise to me. In praise to me. Just keep your hands up. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. Remember, we serve a God who's moved the mountains. We serve the God who's parted seas. We serve a God who's resurrected things, people. If he did it before, oh, I like this crowd. If he did it before, he'll do it again. He'll do it again, and you're going to hear that again. He'll do it again. So Jehoshaphat, what did he do? Number one, he sought God. He sought God. When fear came, God, I got this fear thing coming behind me. He sought God. The second thing he did is he believed what he had received. What was declared to him? He believed it. He believed. So in verse 20, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. He believed in the word that he was given. We need to believe in the word of God. Our ability to emerge victorious out of our situations, even though it doesn't look like it's good. How many of you have been in situations that you're like, oh, I don't think this is going to work out. I, oh, man, I, I'm, I don't know how I'm ever going to get through this. I don't know how we're going to deal with bankruptcy, honey. I don't know how we're going to be able to. We haven't had a job. I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And God is saying, do you believe in my word? Do you believe in me? Do you trust in me? So our ability to come out of this stems from our ability to receive the word of God, to believe the word of God, because it's one thing to be given the word of God. I could tell you, God's going to prosper you. God's going to do this for you. And then you're going to sit there and I receive it. And then walk out of here and say, but I don't believe it. I could be sharing this week after week after week with you, and you're receiving and saying, hey, good word, pastor. I hope you say that. Good word, pastor. But then you walk out of here, and you don't walk in the reality of the word because you didn't believe it. All you did was receive it. Jehoshaphat received it, and then he believed it, and he declared it to the people. He actually told the people, you need to believe as well. Believe it. Believe in your ability. Believe that you're going to come out victorious out of this because God's got it. It's his battle. He's the one doing the fighting. So you need to believe in the voice of God, not the voice of fear. Which voice is louder in your life? Come on now. Which voice is louder? Right now, I've got the loud voice. 
believe the voice of God, not the voice of fear, because believing in the voice of fear is going to put you in a totally different place from where God never wanted you to be in. Amen? We need to believe the voice of God, and it happens to us so many different times, different situations. I'll throw myself under the bus. I was driving my vehicle Thursday. We were doing something, or I was doing something, and I, there's a situation that I've been praying about, that I've been keeping it before the Lord, because doubt started to come in, right? Nobody's ever dealt with doubt before, right? It's just me, okay. Doubt started coming in, so I've been praying about this, praying about this, so I'm in my car, and I'm like thinking about it, and all of a sudden I thought to myself, no, pray, stop thinking, just pray, pray. And as, you know, this is all happening within seconds, milliseconds, as I'm about to pray it, just before I can get words out of my mouth, this song comes on. Do it again. The song, uh, Do It Again, is by Elevation. Do it again. I can't even think of the words right now. But it comes on, and it's one of those songs for me that when I hear it, I get into shower mode. You all know what shower mode is? That when you start singing... No, uh, when you start singing in your shower and you start, you know you're off key, you know, you don't care because to you, you sound good and you're belting it out like, and you're just letting it out there. And that's normally what happens to me with this song that I just lose myself in it, about to worship God. And all of a sudden I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. You need to pray. That's what you're going to do. So I say, all right, I'm about to pray. And I hear God's voice say, don't pray. I'm like, don't pray. The devil is a liar. That is not God talking. God would never say not to pray. I'm going to pray. And I'm getting ready to gear up. And all of a sudden, don't pray. I'm like, God, why would you not want me to pray? He says, don't pray and don't sing. I can understand the sing part. Don't pray (laughs) and don't sing. He says, just listen. Sometimes... We want to do everything but listen. You know, we, we, we're, we're ready to, to speak. We're ready to declare. We're ready to rebuke. We're ready to cast. We're ready. And God's like, just listen. Well, what he wanted me to do was listen to the lyrics for the first time as if it was the very first time again. And he spoke to me. You may listen to the song yourself and feel like, you know, It probably could apply to any situation. This song, for me, spoke in a way that I've never heard it before. And it actually, after I heard it again, it was hard to pick up what God shared with me until I shared it with Millie later that evening. He walked me through. It was like his spirit was walking me through it and guiding me through and saying, I've got this situation. I've done it before. I'll do it again. I've delivered you from this. I've helped you in this situation. I didn't abandon you in that situation. I've done all these things for you. I've provided for you. So you need not worry about this situation. Just continue to pray and praise me. Not worry. Not have doubt. Don't have fear. Don't have fear. So in the song itself, there's also a part that has a pause, like for worship. And, you know, that's where I really go, you know, shower mode. It's like, you know, working them chords. And he had me pause again, and what he had me do was, because in the song it says remember. It's like bringing him back to remembering. And he showed me those things. He was showing me the journey. He was showing me everything that we have gone through, everywhere that we've gone. And he was saying, this isn't the end of your journey. This is just the beginning. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. He said, I brought you to this point. To connect you to the next point. I didn't bring you to this point to just have you fall off and that's it or that's it. It's over. I brought you to this point to connect you to the next point. So if you don't allow yourself to receive the fear, then you'll be able to hear me. But if you continually allow to let doubt in, this is God talking to me. If you continually allow doubt to come in, then you're not going to be able to hear me. You're not going to be able to guide, be guided by me. You're not going to be able to believe the words that I'm sharing to you because you can't even hear them. That cloud of doubt, the cloud of fear surrounds you and you're not able to go forward. But like he said, this isn't the end of your journey. It's just the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you this is not the end of your journey. This is the beginning of your journey. 
do not fear. God is telling us, do not fear. You're just getting started with him. It's not the end of your journey. Let go of fear. Come out from that dome. Come out from the, you know, take off those different headphones. Throw them to the side because God says, I have so much more for you. I have so much more for you. Amen? So, seek God because the battle's his. Believe, receive, right? Then the next thing he does is rejoice in the Lord. He rejoiced in the Lord. What a concept there. Those three things. In verse 21 it says, When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. He picked people. Hey, I want you to sing. I want you to sing. I want you to sing. You're all going to sing. And then those who should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the armies and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing, listen to this. When they began to sing and praise, the Lord, did the people do this? Who does it say? The Lord. The Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. They were defeated. As they sang and praised, they were defeated. By who? They didn't lift up a hand. They didn't throw a stone. They didn't throw a spear. They didn't grab a, you know, whatever they had. Nothing. They used their mouths and spoke, sang, and praised God. When they praised, when they praised, Oh, somebody's going to get it here any second now. When they praised, they praised, it caused the... When they praised, right? When they praised. So what do you have more of? Do you have more praise in you or do you have more fear in you? Do you have more worship in you or do you have more worry in you? Because when they praise, we're able to continuously move forward in him when we praise because the battle is not ours, it's God. When we praise, it's easy to, to shout when the war is over. It's easy to shout when the battle's over. It's easy to praise God when the battle's over, but can you do it in the storm? Can you do it during the war? Can you do it? Can you stand up and shout and say, I'm going to sing unto the Lord a new song. I'm going to sing praise because I'm not going to stay here under the domain of fear. I'm going to walk in the dominion of God. Amen. In the dominion of God. Amen? Amen. You know, and some of you may be saying, you may be standing right now and say, but I can't help but think about fear sometimes. I can't help. It grabs me. It holds me. It doesn't let me move forward. I can't overcome it. Well, that's contradicting the word of God. That's contradicting the word of God because the word of God says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The word of God also says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Fear is a stronghold. So therefore, it's saying for the pulling down of strongholds, we can pull down fear out of our lives. All we have to do is seek God, believe and receive, and praise Him. Amen? Don't allow the worry to grab a hold of you. Don't allow it to push you back, to keep you back. Don't allow it to paralyze you. Nobody here is paralyzed. Stop walking, stop living paralyzed lives because God didn't give it to you. Amen? God did not give it to you. So I have to ask this question. Am I preaching to somebody today? Am I preaching to somebody today? Is there somebody that's in here that's been dealing with fear and allowing fear to govern their lives? Is there somebody in here that you've been living in that domain of fear instead of the dominion of God? And if it is you, I'm going to ask you right now to let go of that fear and come forward and let us pray for you. Come forward right now and let us pray for you collectively, not individually, but as a body. You raised your hand, so don't hold back now because fear is now trying to grip you and say, oh, don't go up there. Don't go up there. You all were clapping. You all were praising. Yep, he's preaching to me, he's preaching to me, but now everybody's still in their seats. 
Come and receive your freedom. Do you want the freedom or do you want fear? You know, shackles, you know, shackles around your feet. You know, get your praise on. Get rid of the shackles. Get your praise on. Get rid of the shackles. Get your praise on. Get rid of the shackles. Come and receive what God has for you. Come forward now. Don't hold back. Don't let that pew hold you back. Don't let the pew hold you back. Come and receive your freedom now. It's one thing to stand up and praise. Yeah, yeah, what he said. You received it, but now are you going to believe what I'm sharing with you? Come and receive your freedom. Amen? Come and receive it. I want to pray over everybody today. I want to pray because you have to realize that the fear is not something that God gave you. It's what the enemy is trying to put on you. So stop carrying what the enemy gives you. We talked a few weeks ago about the yoke, the yoke of Jesus. That's the yoke we want, not the one of fear, not the one that the enemy tries to place on us. We want what God has for us, not what the enemy tries to put on us. I don't want to dress up like the enemy. I want to dress up in what God has for me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everybody ready to be free? Everybody ready to be free and walk in that newness and that freedom? Right? Let's pray. Come on, let's pray. So, Father, we just thank you, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, Father. And we praise you, Lord, and we give you glory, and we thank you that every battle, Lord God, every battle that we're involved in, it's you who fight for us, O Lord. It's you who's there for us. It's you who guides us. It's you who delivers us. It's you who provides for us. It's you, O God. And we ask you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you rebuke the fear in the lives of the people that are here right now, O Lord. As they came up, Father God, as a witness to your power, as a witness to your love, Father, I ask that you would grant them sound minds now, O Lord, in the name of Jesus. Whatever it is that's been trying to come against them in their minds, in their lives, in their health, in whatever area of their life, Father God, I thank you that they no longer walk in the realm of fear, Father God, but in the realm of power, in the realm of praise, in the realm of worship, Father God, in your realm of your spirit, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, Father God. So I thank you for bringing healing in their lives, O oh Lord. Whether it's physically, whether it's emotionally, I thank you for the healing that's taking place even now. I thank you that shackles are falling. I thank you that chains are breaking. I thank you that people are being freed right now, O oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God. And we thank you that as the people of Judah received their freedom and their enemies were destroyed, I thank you that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, that they are victorious, and whatever the enemy meant for evil, Father God, at this moment now, you're turning it for good, O Lord. So we just thank you, Father God, and we say and we declare, no more room for fear, just faith in you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah. Realize for everybody that the deeper you go in God, the enemy is going to continue to come at you. So today isn't about ridding ourselves of fear. Because like I said, fear is going to continue to come. It's learning how to navigate through that fear. Be able to navigate towards God and overcoming it so we will no longer live paralyzed lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me just finish with this. Do you know that in Scripture... Close to 350 times, in one way or another, it says, do not fear. Do not fear. Do not doubt. Do not worry. Do not fear. Close to 350 times. Do you know what's the only other phrase that beats do not fear? Praise the Lord. And it's because of the book of Psalms. Because it's throughout the whole Bible, but you know the book of Psalms has it in there. So the number one thing God is telling us to do is to praise him. The number two thing he says is don't have fear. Don't have fear. So if I was to do a scale of step one, step two, and step three, step one would be praise the Lord. Step two, do not fear. Step three, if you feel fear, go back to step one. Go back to step one. God moved mountains, folks. He parted seas. He raised the dead. How much more will he do for you? We need not fear. If he did it before, he'll do it again. So I just thank God. Come on, one more time. Put your hands together for the Lord. God bless you all. I'll leave you with this last scripture, Psalm 27, 1 and 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is my, the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to eat my, my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this, I will be confident. It's in God. Amen? Amen. So God bless you all. I thank God for all of you. For those that were watching online, thank God for you. May his covering, may his peace continue. No more fear, just faith in him. God bless you all, and I look forward to seeing you all again here at the Crossroads. <laughs>